Today's episode of Dungeon Crawlers Radio is brought to you by Gamers Inn, your one-stop location for all your gaming needs. Located in Lehigh City, Utah, their fun and friendly staff will be more than happy to answer any of your gaming needs. Just remember, Gamers Inn, it's where adventures begin. Broadcasting live from the DCR studio. Oh, yeah! The Geek Revolution starts here. Excellent! Get ready for the number one hit geek radio show out there. Well, it is impressive, isn't it? Because it's time for Dungeon Crawlers Radio. All right, everyone, welcome. We are here at LTUE, and I don't know what room I'm in, but I'm in a room with author Dan <laughs> Wells uh, to talk about the latest book in the Mirador series, which is Active Memory. So for those that don't know who, what it is, you know, there was uh, ones and zeros, and now I'm blanking the on the first, first one. first one was blue screen. That's right, blue screen. First was blue screen, second was ones and zeros, third is Active Memory. Yes. Which, fantastic covers. I love how... Each one has a different color that kind of stands out. Because mm-hmm. we had blue, we had orange last one, and this is kind of green now. Yeah, and uh, it's the covers are done with um, uh, photos of models uh, by uh, Harper. And then all the cyberpunk background cityscape art was done by a French artist named Sebastian Hugh, who is incredible. And if you're looking for science fiction art, mm-hmm. go straight to him. Uh, I found out two days ago that he has never been given any copies of the books. So <laughs> we're going to be sending him <laughs> copies of the books that his art is on. Wow. Um, so where do, do we go now? I mean, because we've, we've gone through the journey with Blue Screen and Ones and Zeros. Where does the story lead? Because this is kind of wrapping everything up, right? Yeah. So um, kind of the intention with the series is that these would be a little more episodic, uh, that you don't have to read them in order. Um, I envisioned it as kind of the X-Files model, where if you do watch the episodes in order, there's a big story going on underneath, Mm -hmm. but you can pretty much pick up any episode and watch it and be fine. Um, That comes to a head now in book three. There's been these mysteries that have been percolating in the background of the other two, and book three is the one that deals with them head on. So how did Marisa lose her arm in a car accident when she was two years old? And what happened, and where is the feud, and and who is the identity of the kind of this dark net hacker uh, who seems to know all the secrets? Um, and so it is a self-contained story, but it is going to be even more satisfying if you've read the first two, because you'll have seen little clues and hints of what's going on in the background. So it's a cyberpunk crime thriller that is also a ghost story, and it's awesome. Nice. Now, I mean, this would be awesome to see as a TV series. I mean, we've kind of seen a few TV series that have popped up that that cyberpunk theme, uh, Alter Carbon, which there's a few questionable things about it, but it's still a great, (laughs) fantastic story. Uh, This would be amazing to see as a TV series on Netflix or even on normal TV. Yeah, um, the... The bad news for cyberpunk, because cyberpunk has been slowly working its way back into the public consciousness. Um, It is hugely relevant all over again, uh, and people are writing it, and it's kind of gaining ahead of steam. And then last year, Ghost in the Shell was so bad. Oh, I know. And it was such a huge kind of mallet to the knee of cyberpunk in Hollywood. And we all despaired of, oh, well, now we'll never sell anything because they think cyberpunk doesn't work. But um, already in the works at that point were Ready Player One mm-hmm. and Altered Carbon. Uh, Altered Carbon is out and uh, is a huge hit for Netflix. Ready Player One is going to make a zillion dollars yeah, when, it, when it lands in the summer. And at that point, I think... I think that is going to undo all of the bad press that Ghost in the Shell gave to the genre and uh, Hollywood and TV and everyone's going to be looking for more properties. So I sincerely hope, even if it's not mine, I sincerely hope we get a new spate 
of cyberpunk movies and TV shows and books and everything because it's one of my favorite genres. Well, I mean, that's kind of with where things are going, especially I mean, Ready Player One. The Void has their virtual reality s- mm-hmm. simulation stuff going out. There's several other companies. It wouldn't be that hard to have the Oasis here soon. And, you know, of course, it, Ready Player One's a huge 80s Mm-hmm. festival of g- <laughs> yumminess and awesomeness. Uh, so I'm excited for that, probably more than the Star Wars Han Solo movie, which is kind of <laughs> sad. Um, so I, what was it like kind of writing this? Because, you know, with John Cleaver, that's more kind of horror, uh, thriller, stuff like that. And then jumping to the cyberpunk had to be a little bit different. But, I mean, well, you still kind of did partial stuff. It, it's sort of different, but... I mean, if you've read any of my non-John Cleaver stuff, you see that I still put elements of horror into all of it. Uh, And one of the things I wanted to play with in book three um, of Mirador is biotech. Mm -hmm. Because I've dealt with, you know, self-driving cars and autonomous drones and and internet connectivity and cybernetics and all these other fun things, virtual reality. And so for book three, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to play with biotech. That's another looming technology. It's another thing that's going to be... A, uh, an increasingly larger part of our world. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to uh, come up with a villain who still gets to be very creepy mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and still use some of those nice horror chops. Uh, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of fun. I think people are going to like it a lot. And like I said, it's also, on top of that, kind of also a ghost story, um, which was... Which was when I told my editor that I was going to do a cyberpunk ghost story, he's like, how does that even work? Uh, but we made it work, and nice. it's, it's pretty fun. Nice. So the writing process for you, everyone's different, it seems like. So what is your process when it comes to sitting, you have the idea, mm-hmm. plotting it out, r- outlining, what do you do to get it from the idea to actually on the page? So starting with an idea... Um, I will, you know, the first things I'm trying to figure out then are, uh, you know, if I'm starting from an idea, well, what problems can this idea cause? And what kinds of people, excuse me, what characters are going to be most damaged or most hurt or most involved with those problems? And that is going to let me know what kind of conflicts and characters that I'm dealing with. If, on the other hand, I start with a character... Well, then I think, well, what are the problems this character is going to cause? And what are the situations that those problems are going to create? Uh, And so, you know, so no matter where I start from, the next step is figuring out what the conflicts are because that's what tells you about the story. Once I have a story in mind, then I will build an outline. And I will take, you know, sometimes a month or two. I do very extensive outlines, um, scene by scene. And when I've got a scene-by-scene description of everything that happens in the book, that's when it is time to sit down and write. I try to do about 3,000 words a day. Sometimes it is less. Uh, Sometimes it's more. Uh, I've started a new organizational system to uh, organize my time a little better, and that's helped a lot. So uh, on the the book that I finished last year, the third one, I was was getting 4,000 to 5,000 words a day, which is which is rare for me, but uh, we'll see if I can keep it up this year on whatever I write next. So, yeah, that's that's where we are. And, and then, you know, crank out that whole thing, get a first draft done, run it past my agent and, and some of my alpha readers and see what they think and then just kind of hone it from there. I, I also just recently uh, formed a writing group. Uh, starting in college, I was in a writing group with Brandon forever, yeah. uh, but long before either of us, Brandon Sanderson, long before either of us were published. And we kept that going until about six years ago when I moved out of the country. Yeah. And then I moved back to a different city, so I'm not really near him anymore and haven't had a writing group for that whole time and, and have really been feeling the lack of it. So last year in like October or so, uh, we I grabbed a couple other local authors, Matt Kirby, who does middle grade and he also writes all of the assassin's creed novels yeah. and then wendy tolliver who does <clears throat> excuse me i'm kind of losing my voice at this convention wendy tolliver does uh ya as well and she's also writing all the tie-in fiction for once upon a time nice. and she uh she ran a middle grade novel through our writing group that was just just like offensively good like <laughs> um like 
often when I read books, I think, you know, that's really good. Good for you. And I read her book and was like, I, I wish I had written this. Yeah. I'm jealous of your talent. So, uh, and so Wendy and Matt and I have been helping each other with our books, and, and that is helping a lot as well. So that's kind of my process at this point. So that brings up a good question because uh, I, I have, don't have a writing group, and I've thought maybe I should. Is, is it really that important? Does it add more to your writing to have that group? Yes, it does. The, the book that I've been running through the writing group, and uh, you know, I finished it a while ago, but going at, at like a chapter a week or whatever we do is kind of taking them longer to get through it. Um, it's called The Swarm, and it is kind of a standalone teen horror novel that's like The Girl with the Silver Eyes meets Stranger Things. Okay. That's my pitch for that. Uh, psychic kids in Denver fighting monsters. And I really love, really, really love the main character and the, the and her voice. But there were parts of that character that weren't working. And I was kind of blinded to that because of how much I love the character's yeah. voice. And so having the writing group was invaluable because they were able to say, okay, this is where the voice is not coming through. Or here's another character who doesn't really have a distinctive voice at all. And also, here's this big plot problem. And, you know, they're all things that uh, that I, my editor potentially, I assume, would have caught because yeah. my editors are all amazing. Um, but getting them fixed now so that the editor doesn't have to deal with those just means that when it gets to the editor, it's going to be polished even further. Yeah. Uh, and so that's it's going to be great. One of the other good things that came out of that writing group was there was one particular relationship uh, between the main character and her foster mother that I liked, and it was it was kind of a high point of the book for me. But uh, the writing group was able to help me hone that so that it became an even stronger relationship and and stronger characters and. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say enough good. I've always had, except you know, for that little break when I was out of the country. I've always had, I've always had writing groups, and I've always loved them. And uh, I recommend them to anyone who's a writer. All right, sounds great. So, with you know the, the events going on, was it fun? You know, kind of coming up with these really crazy ideas. I mean, re researching biotech. I mean, you, that's got to be interesting in itself, but. What what was that like? Going in there, delving into that, learning that, and then going, okay, now I'm going to do all this wicked evilness. <laughs> well, that's the fun part, right? Is, uh, you know, as writers, people ask where we get our ideas from. That's not the hard part. The ideas are everywhere. Oh, yeah. You know, any science fiction writer can, uh, you know, especially if you've been writing for a while and you've been practicing the skill of, of using ideas, you can come up with a thousand awful things to do to your characters but doing the research so that you are using actual ideas from the real world and actual technology that either exists now or is being developed now can spark so many more ideas you never would have come up with on your own and I love that I love reading about um, about new advances and new theories there was a thing several years ago where a uh, a professor in a university environment uh, studying neurology had figured out a way that he could delete memories from mice. Okay. And the article talking about this said that uh, he didn't want to do human trials because they didn't yet know the full repercussions of what would happen. Mm -hmm. And also that he was worried that no one would be willing to give up their memories. Yeah. And then the follow-up article said that he was deluged by thousands, maybe tens of thousands of offers of people saying, I do not want to remember. Please let me be uh, you know, a human volunteer for this project. Yeah. And that one story by itself, I sat down and I wrote like six short stories just on the concept of memory deletion, on the concept of, of what happens if, if some memories are gone or if all the memories are gone, what happens to memories that, that get replaced, and what is it like to have memories that you hate so much that make you so uncomfortable or so sad or so lost or hurt that you're willing to just lose your entire life and memory to get rid of them. Um, 
So yeah, like the more you learn about technology and about the things that people can do and that are doing or are afraid to do with the technology, ideas are everywhere. I mean, that poses a really good question because, I mean, if you take away any of those memories, does that change your personality? Because your personality is based on your events uh, of your life. So, I mean, if you have something really traumatic or bad, I can understand wanting to get rid of that. But does that change who you are and how you then uh, interact with experiences that may be similar to that? Well, and from an author's point of view, there's at least two directions to take that. Is First of all, I'm going to tell the story about the person who has their memories removed and then their personality irrevocably changes. Yeah. And then I also want to tell the story about the person who has certain memories removed and their personality doesn't change. And they realize that they are reacting to some event in the past that they have no memory of. But their body, their mind, their neurochemistry still recalls and is still suffering trauma from. Uh, Those are both incredibly provocative ideas. And there's probably way more ideas where you could take the same idea. So that's one of the reasons I love science fiction is the ability to explore that. Nice. Now, so we we have these events uh, with the books. You're writing them episodically so people can read one, three, four, whatever, in any order. Um, and that was done intentionally. Have the, the readers kind of enjoyed that, that they could just jump in wherever and it doesn't matter? I mean, or, or maybe you don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if readers have enjoyed it. I have loved it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, Because my goal with uh, Mirador was to make them episodic so that I could sell them in any order. Um, Because I hate, and every author hates this, you know, if you have a new book out and you're doing a signing in a bookstore and somebody comes up and is like, I loved the the little talk you gave, I loved the reading, I'd like to buy that book. And you're like, well, that's actually book two of a series, and so you have to buy book one. Or even worse, that's book two of a series and they're sold out of book one. Yeah. And then you just lost the sale. And so series are great for reader loyalty because readers love it. Um, I, w- I just did a, a little coffee clutch with a group of people, and we're talking about, um, you know, the way that publishers and readers and authors all kind of perceive series differently. And, and one girl in the group said, you know, speaking as a young adult, I want to let you know that I want all series to be like 10,000 books long because I, I love the characters and I want to read as much as I can about them. And so, yes... We love writing series for that reason. Yeah. But I also want to be able to, you know, hand anybody any of the books and say, here, you can start here, and it's a great story. No, I mean, it's definitely, that's one of the things that's always frustrating, you know, especially like, hey, this book looks very interesting. You start perusing through it, and then you're like, find out it's four of mm-hmm. 12 or four or something, and you're like, uh, and then you go look. Sometimes they don't always have. Maybe they have three and one, but not they're missing book two, and then you're like, eh, and you yeah. skip it. Well, and I've also run into the case where I pick up books. Often this happens at a convention where there's, you know, like the free book table or a swag table yeah. or, uh, um, you know, friends of mine who are selling their new book. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll pick up your new book without realizing it's actually book two. And I'll get halfway through and think, this is really intriguing world building the like all the things that she's not telling me about her fantasy world (laughs) and then halfway through i'll realize oh (laughs) that's why it's because it's book two of a series um and sometimes that pays off uh like i read uh book two of a fantasy series by carrie patel that uh, and i can't remember the name of it right now but uh it was about subterranean cities and uh, really enjoyed it even though it was book two and i didn't realize it was book two like I said, the, the world building was intriguing to me because of how much wasn't being explained. Yeah. And so it was kind of kind of piquing my interest as a, as a world builder and as an author to kind of figure out what the secrets were. Um, but then I've also read other books where you kind of get into that same mindset and you're like, oh, this is kind of intriguingly written. And then you realize that the mysteries are never going to be explained because they were not intended to be mysteries. Uh, and so it it can be occasionally good and occasionally very frustrating. Awesome. Well, it looks like they're going to kick us out of the room. Yeah, uh, I, we don't know what room we're in, but somebody else does and wants it. Yes. So. so if you haven't already, check out the Mirador series. Pick up, uh, if you have, you know, blue screen and ones and zeros, pick up uh, Active Memory. If you haven't, pick up, pick up all three. You've got a whole series now you can read, uh, which is even better. And Dan will love that. Uh, so pick, a, pick it up uh, if you're... Um, you're not here at LTV because you're not going to hear it at the same time. Uh, but uh, where can they find you? 
Well, I've got a long string of stuff I'm doing this year. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in Pensacola at Pensacon. Uh, soon after that, I'm going to Silicon Valley Comic Con. And then uh, I don't remember off the top of my head all, all the other events, but they're on my website, yeah. thedanwells.com. I have my events page there. I try to keep it uh, updated as soon as I get a new event. And I've got at least one major convention every month this year. So, awesome. That's super cool. Including I'm going to Argentina in May wow. to the Buenos Aires Book Festival. So That's if awesome. you're in Argentina, come see me there. Yes. Uh, and make sure it is the Dan Wells because otherwise you might find some supermodel. Yeah. <laughs> so pick up Active Memory. It's going to be a great book. In fact, I'm going to go get my copy now. And uh, we'll catch you next time. You're listening to Dungeon Crawlers Radio. Please subscribe and follow them on Facebook or Twitter, pushes. No, we're even promoting these filthy idiots. We just mm-hmm. like them. We just like anyone. They are friends, pushes. They are friends. No, shut up. Please subscribe. <laughs>